the king of Syria was making war against Israel and he consulted with his servant saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent the king of Israel saying, beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly touched by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike the people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Lord, open our eyes that we would see that those who are with us is far greater than those who are against us. Hallelujah. I don't know, I think that's, we deserve a little bit more than that. Come on, those who are with us are far greater than those who are against us. Lord, I pray that You would open up our eyes today, Father. Lord, that we would see that greater are You that is in us, Lord, than He who that is in the world. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh God, we need You. Holy Spirit, we need You. thinking, stay standing, you can sit in a minute. Um, I was just thinking while we were worshipping just about that and how sometimes, you know, I'm thinking about all of the, you know, we've just gone through this, we've just had it kind of like a mini move of God come through our church. Anybody want to agree with that? And I love God's grace for us because He doesn't give us more than what we can handle and He doesn't allow us to say Stay silly in a season. Well, that's my prayer. Anyway. <laughs> Maybe not, that's not so true. Um, but he, he always gives us like this ground that we can occupy. So at first, it's a little bit hard going. We're fighting. We're battling it out for this te- new territory. And then all of a sudden, the fight stops because the enemy has been defeated But it is not the time, Peak Vision Church, to sit back with your coffee and your latte in your hand and get out a book and read. I'm preaching to myself here. Cup of tea, not a coffee. But (laughs) Kent's like, yes, amen. It is not the time for us to just fold over and just be like, oh, the work is done. Oh, mate, it is just beginning. There is so much more territory and land that God wants us to occupy as a church. And it's like I've always said, it's not just Kent and I or Jack and Sari. It's all of us. We all have a part to play in this. Why? Because the Word of God says that the spiritual gifts are for who? Everybody. Everybody. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's for you. It's for you. Cool. Okay, you can have a seat. So, welcome. If it's your first time today or you're pretty new, 
my prayer is that somebody has welcomed you with a smile, with a greeting, and maybe even uh, a little bit of a conversation. <laughs> Who finds that difficult? Yeah. Oh, come on, let's be honest. Or I have a house full of door greeters. It is a little bit difficult. It's awkward. Think about this. If you were inviting someone into your home for a meal, what would you want them to feel? Welcome. You want them to feel safe. You'd want them to feel hungry because they can smell the goodness that you've been preparing a lot of the time for hours. You know, you want them to feel safe. Same. It's just the same. Oh, hi. Hi. So, my name's Pania, and honestly, this list on here, look, it goes like this. So, we're going to have a busy morning. Are you ready? We're going to need to strap some seatbelts on. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, for, uh, Lord, what you've been doing in this house. Lord, we continue to surrender her to you. Lord, this is your bride. You love her way more than we ever could, God. But our heart is that you would give us a heart for your house. Lord, that we would have a heart, Lord, to be beautiful, to be spotless and pure before you, Father God. Lord, that we would, uh, Lord, be a tangible presence of the kingdom of God in our community, Lord. Not only in our community, Lord, but in our online community, Lord, as people tune in, Lord, and administer to and blessed by the Word of God from this house. God, I pray your anointing on this Word. I thank you for the anointing in this house. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, uh, who was at the youth service? <laughs> like, oh, I just, but the biggest outlying factor that spoke to me about that was how the kids acknowledging that it was somebody else's spiritual gift that made them feel seen. It was somebody else's spiritual gift that made them see, be seen by a creator God. Now that's powerful. It's a tool. I want you to think about that. So we, I'm just gonna kind of pick off where we, where I was at months ago. So I had been doing a study by Havila Cunnington about discovering and activating the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I thought it was an amazing word for our house. And my heart was, God, how the heck do I teach this? Because obviously not many people operate in all of these things. We operate in part and we all operate differently. Ha, interestingly enough. And so I was like, God, how do I, how do me, little old me, teach that? And you know what? God has been faithful every week. There's been an outpouring of His Spirit and His gifts have been flowing in the house. And I'm just like, okay, you've got, you've got this, Lord. Um, but I was sharing with my connect group, um, my life group, my table, all our ladies are awesome. Uh, my little drop there for the girls. Um, my group is better than yours. <coughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I totally lost my train of thought now. <laughs> so, it's too excited about group. Uh, anyway, I was telling you something and it's gone right out of my head. So I'll just carry on. Obviously, you weren't meant to hear that right now. So Ephesians 4 verses 7 in the New King, King James Version says this, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And the NLT says a special gift. There's no such thing as an ungifted believer. Say to your neighbor, bro, you got talent. <laughs> now, what I thought is interesting here is that the Greek word for gift comes from, uh, comes from the word charis. I'm sorry, any Greek speaking people in here, please don't be offended at me, I'm trying my hardest. Uh, and it was a Greek word, it was a word used in Greek mythology. So remembering at this time, the word of God, the Bible, the, you know, the gospel hadn't gone out past, well, really, the Jews. And so this is when it was coming into the day of the Gentiles. And Paul's trying to explain spiritual gifts to a, to a Gentile population who had no idea, no, no past reference to go, oh, that's what he's talking about. So he uses one of their own words in those times. And it was a word known culturally. And what it meant, this, this Greek word charis, was an empowering touch given by the gods, so little g, so their gods of that time, resulting in favor or grace. They believed that when the gods touched you, it changed you forever, 
leaving you with supernatural powers. It didn't just make your life better, it left a residual empowerment. And Paul wants us to know that this gift that God has for us will change us forever. It will change us forever. And so I think about, you know, the painting on the wall, God touching man, you know, like a physical touch, like God has come down and he's touched us. He's given us this grace gift. It's nothing that I've done. It's I haven't gone to Bible college to get it. I haven't been, you know, in a, my marriage isn't 100% awesome all of the time. Like, do you know what I mean? I'm not always a great mum. You know, actually sometimes you can, we can be bad at that, but it's not by what we've done. It is simply by the grace gift and the touch from God. And we need to see this. We need to know this. And it's, it's important because it means that we can't actually take the glory for it. Because we've done In fact, God uses us and gifts, gifts us with grace gifts in spite of us. I can say that. I can testify to that. Um, so they're not given by merit. Um, it is, <laughs> and it doesn't mean also that once I have this gift, my life will be forever perfect. It doesn't mean that we stop growing. It means that we're still gonna grow. We're still gonna fail all the time. Failure is not an option, it's a necessity because it's how we grow. And <laughs> so, charisma, so this comes from that Greek word charis, charisma doesn't prove someone's character. So I think in the coming times and the days we're entering, charisma is very, gonna be very misleading because they look like it, they smell like it. They can even operate in it because it's a grace gift and it's not by what we do or how submitted our life is. Gift, it's been given, it's irrevocable. And so uh, that character comes from a Greek word meaning chisel or the mark left by a chisel. In the great sculptor Michelangelo, when he was asked what he saw when he approached a massive block of marble, his reply was brilliant. I see a beautiful form trapped inside and it is my responsibility to take my mallet and chisel and chip away until the figure is set free. So right now, I just want you to close your eyes and think about that. Think about you're you're just a big block of marble and God is using Holy Spirit right now to just come with his mallet and his chisel and he's chiseling away. to the figure that is set inside us is free. Hmm. So charisma is like a wand, a divine touch with immediate empowerment. It requires no effort, just receiving. It's a supernatural power. Character is like the chisel, an inward working that takes effort over a period of time. Charisma does not prove my character. This helps to keep us humble. Charisma is an outward gift of grace and character is an inward working of the Holy Spirit. A great question to ask ourselves is, do I have the character to contain and maintain the gifts that God has for me? And why I say that is because even in recent years, we've had so many amazing, faithful, power-filled men and women of God who have fallen aside. How? Because their character is insufficient to contain and maintain the gifts that God has on them. Atali, can you pass my Bible out of my bag? We need this. Like we need air to breathe for our lungs. We need this for our soul. We need this for our spirit. It is our compass. It is our correction. It is our love. It is our exception. Exception? Yes. Acceptance. That sounds better. <laughs> exception. Acceptance. These gifts are given to authenticate our faith here on earth. 
equally to strengthen other believers around us. And if everyone unwraps and activates their gifts, we create a fully functioning, healthy, vibrant spiritual body. Is that not what our... I don't want to be part of a broke, limping, (laughs) powerless body. Who's been sick? Who's had a broken bone? It's not fun. You want to be full of vivacious life. Like we want to be fresh. We want to be alert. We want to be agile. We want to be able to move and create. And just like I was sharing at the beginning, how important it is that these spiritual gifts are operating in fullness in the church. And remember, it's not just for four people or for our other pastors or people who, you know, carry that fivefold mantle. It is for every one of us, every one of you sitting on your chair. Just be like, it's me. You know, brick off that program, it's me. Some of you know that. You do not need to be a mature Christian to operate the gifts of the Spirit. Oh. These gifts are available to us at the beginning of our faith walk. Spiritual gifts provide evidence that there is a specific call on my life. They meet the authentic need to feel needed and wanted. That's a good one. Because we have an innate need in us to be wanted and to feel needed. Spiritual gifts supply a sense of our eternal value, our eternal value to God, and they give room for diversity in the kingdom, each having a unique role. Ha. So there is a difference between a talent and a spiritual gift. Talent depends on natural power. Instruct, inspire, entertain. Spiritual gifts depend on a supernatural power which instructs, inspires, and builds up the saints for service. So a great example of that is, like for me, I was sort of about vocally. So I can sing, but that's just a talent. But what I do with my voice points people to God. That's the supernatural gift. Do you see the difference? It's pretty easy, eh? Talent versus gift. Now, I'm gonna encourage you right now, so just lean in and be like, oh, I'm ready for this. If you think that you don't have anything to offer God, lack talents or feel like a nobody, then listen to this. Abraham was old. Who's used that excuse? Elijah was suicidal. Joseph was abused. Job went bankrupt. Moses had a speech problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. Re- re- Rehab. Rahab was a prostitute. <laughs> Just a little bit of self-correct going on there. I was like, Rahab? Rahab was a prostitute. The Samaritan woman was divorced five times. Noah was a drunk. Jeremiah was young. Jacob was a cheater. David was a murderer. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Peter denied Christ. Not once, not twice, but three times. Martha worried about everything. Zacchaeus was small and money hungry. The disciples fell asleep while praying. One job, pray. Paul was a Pharisee who persecuted Christians before becoming one. Now, how do you feel? Who's ready? (laughs) So, the gifts explained. Here we go. So, in the Passion Translation, we're just using it because it kind of cross-credits the majority of the gifts that Paul uses in the New Testament. So these are not all of the gifts by any means, but they're just nine that he outlines in this passage of Scripture. So 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 11. Each believer, say that, come on, is given continuous revelation by Holy Spirit to benefit not just himself, but all. For example, the Spirit gives to one the gift of the word of wisdom. To another, the same Spirit gives the gift of word of revelation knowledge. And to another, the same Spirit gives the gift of faith. And to another, the same Spirit gives gifts of healing. And to another, the power to work miracles. And to another, the gift of prophecy. And to another, the gift to discern what the Spirit is speaking. And to another, the gift of speaking different kinds of tongues. And to another, the gift of interpretation of tongues. Remember, it is the same Holy Spirit who distributes, activates, and operates these different gifts as He chooses for each believer. 
Whew. So while we're reading that, was anyone like, oh, I want that one? I've got that one? No? Yeah. Can I encourage you, if that's not how you read your Bible, you should. <laughs> I want what that is. I'm going to have that. How do I get it? What does it look like? So Paul has written about nine gifts of the Spirit here over to the letters of the churches in Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians. And he, there's three significant lists that uh, Havilah has actually broken these gifts into. So the first one is the gifts to know something. Know something, not know something. These are revelation gifts, and they have a prophetic flow. The second category is to say something. Say something with your mouth. <laughs> Inspirational gifts, and they operate from a priestly flow. And the last category is to do something. Power gifts that operate from a kingly flow. So, today... Discovering the gift of wisdom. Are you ready? We do need it. So, a gift of supernatural wisdom is a word for the future. A gift of supernatural knowledge is a word for the present. And a gift of supernatural discernment is a word to reveal the unseen source. So if you operate in this word of wisdom, what might that look like? It predicts anticipates and is future-based. It shows God's wisdom in a specific situation. It's supernaturally revealed, delivers an answer to a pressing question, delivers direction to a pressing need, provides insight into future events not known in the natural world. Words of wisdom are strictly exclusive and predictive. Fragments of insight by not the complete picture. So you don't always get a complete picture, you just kind of get this little bit. It's annoying, eh? It's so annoying. Uh, and it's supernatural wisdom points to God's omniscience. God knows all things. He's all-knowing. Nothing is a surprise to him on earth. Um, so Acts 27, 22, where God is just speaking to Paul in a dream and he's shipwrecked. You know, and all of this stuff is happening, and then God says, hey, mate, it's you. <laughs> and then, you know, the crew are like, what should we do? And he's like, oh, just throw me overboard, and it'll all settle, settle down. <laughs> That's a dumb word of wisdom. <laughs> but it was totally God. It was what was needed for the situation, and it did exactly what he said it was going to do. So, is that all Good. We're good. What is the difference between a word of wisdom and a word of, word of wisdom, knowledge, and prophecy? So the knowledge is factual. It's just a fact. It is what it is. It's tangible and can be proven immediately. So example, if you've been to any of the apostles or the prophets who have been coming into town, they've been using people's names. So we got called out. He's a, he was an Indian man, Prophet Tito, uh, and he said... <laughs> Just trying to say Kent's name. It was hilarious. Kent. 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 Because they don't have any idea about our dialect, our names. So he's like Kent. And then he looks at me and he's like, pun, 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 <laughs> Which is fine. Americans can't even say my name properly. But he's giving us factual information. Often they, mostly, not the ones in this house, um, but they're giving factual information. Sometimes it's a phone number, it's an anniversary date, it's a birthday, it's significant events that have happened in your year, um, in a year for your life. Um, so that's kind of what a word of wisdom is. Ah, lost it. Um, a word of knowledge, sorry. Uh, uh, so your name, you did this yesterday, you know, this is what's happening. A word of wisdom is predictive piece of supernatural information to use for something in the future. Uh, uh, like, um, I read a story, actually, Havilah's father, uh, he had a, like a picture of a man in a blue shirt on a white porch. Yeah. And so he was, uh, he said, I need to go and find this man. So he drove around his neighborhood, probably for about half an hour it took him, found the man sitting on the porch. And you were like, what? He did what? He did. But what is he gonna say? Who cares? 
God, he's here. And he just went up to that man and he said, hey, I don't know what's going on in your life, but God showed me a picture of you and he just wants you to know that he loves you. This man broke, gave his heart to the Lord. Who doesn't want a gift like that? You know, who's got, who's got prodigal sons who are out there who, man, if someone went up to them, hey, I've been driving around looking for you for half an hour, God just wants you to know that he loves you. Please, can somebody? See how powerful this is? This is powerful stuff. Uh, prophecy is God's way of communicating what he thinks, feels, and sees. We'll go into that. So that gift of knowledge in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 8. Just remember, the same spirit gives the gift of the word of revelation and knowledge. It's a word for now, for present. Uh, a great example of this story is in John 4 when Jesus is at the well with a Samaritan woman. And even the events of how he got there is like, Jesus, why are you here? But he was on a God assignment. And we're just going to uh, pick up at verse 15. I don't know if it's behind me. Uh, but the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go. Call to your husband and come back. <laughs> oh, I love Jesus. I have no husband, like he didn't know this, she replied, etc. So if you don't know this story, she was married and divorced, I think it was five times, and she was with just a partner, wasn't even married, and Jesus got this revelation knowledge, and it do you know the impact of that wasn't just for her because all of a sudden she is seen by Jesus, who she shouldn't be because she's Samaritan, and culturally that was just, they were dogs. But she takes that to her hometown. You'll never guess I met a man and he told me about my whole life. Entire town gets saved. Spiritual gifts are necessary and so important. That word took her from distraction to destiny. Some of us are distracted and God wants to just go or <laughs> from distraction to destiny. So some characteristics of a word of knowledge. It's provable, accurate and present based. It's God's knowledge in a specific situation again, supernaturally revealed. It reveals God's investment in every aspect of our lives, even the most minor details. It touches our need for identity and belonging. It exposes the truth and a path of deliverance if needed. It provides knowledge not known by everyone, but known in the natural world. It's very factual and again points to God's omniscience. <laughs> so, the power of an intimate relationship with God is the secret to moving in your spiritual gifts. Amen. Yield, be in unity with him, obey him. So the power of an intimate relationship with God is the secret to moving in your spiritual gifts. Yield, surrender, be in unity with him, and then obey. Are you okay? This is all right? Discovering the gift of discernment. Again, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10. And to another, the gift to discern what the Spirit is speaking. So the advantage of this gift is the ability to understand the unseen source. Remember that these gifts come from revelation and prophetic flow. <laughs> she calls it heaven's intelligence. Ever have a bad feeling that something wasn't right? Or when you meet someone, you're like, oh, something's not right. There's something off here. Not in a judgy way, but your spirit just picks up something. We need to remember that we are spiritual people. We have an enemy who is absolutely, let me tell you, absolutely opportunistic. He is always looking for ways to distract and defeat us. In 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11, it just says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. 
And it's really important. Uh, why is that relevant? Uh, she was sharing a story about she was preaching overseas, so her husband wasn't with her. And a pastor who she'd ministered in his church a, a number of times messaged her because she'd put a post up and he said to her, oh, hey, I see you're in town. Do you want to catch, catch up and have a coffee? You can come to my place or I can come and see you. And so instantly she was like, oh, she didn't really think much of it. But then she'd already predetermined or predecided when she's out on ministry things that she wouldn't, wouldn't do, would and wouldn't do. One of those was, I will not be meeting with a man in my hotel room who is not my husband. And, and we laugh at that, but we think we could have got that message and gone, oh, oh, he just wants to catch up. Totally innocent. There's nothing in that. And so anyway, in the end, she toiled a little bit what to do. And then she just was like, well, God, actually, I'm just not going to do anything. She didn't even respond to his message. And then she found out maybe six months to a year later that that pastor had actually been living a double life. She just knew there was a knowing inside of her. Hmm, something's not right about that. I'm just going to leave it well alone. Uh, Another example of that was we went to, and I think we've shared this before, we were in America, we went to Grow Conference. If we ever get the opportunity, <coughs> trustees, to take a team of people to Grow, <coughs> amazing, and it's just the way they do church and serve people. I know the context in church is a little different in America, but just the way they are able to serve people and serve us, like we were incredibly blessed while we were there. Um, and I, had, I remember it was middle of winter, here, so it was summer over there. Oh, I was so excited. I'm a lie on the beach, lie on the pool, beach, you know, get in the tan on. And we had put some extra time so we could stay longer. And so the conference had finished. Money was doing weird things. I don't understand what was happening. But anyway, Kent comes in and he says to me, very bravely, we need to go home. Oh, mate. I was nasty mad at him because I was like, I was planned out my days by the pool. I was furious. Like, I was so mad. I just, I think I even walked out. Did I walk out? He's like, yeah, you did. <laughs> it was so bad. So bad. And he's like, oh, you just, I was like, I'll be fine. I just need a minute. I just need a minute. So anyway. Yeah. Anyway, so he managed to change the flights. It was all very, it was very inexpensive, which it should have been. But anyway, so God paving away for Kent's bad decision from what I could see. Anyway, we got home and little did we know that one of our children actually really needed us. And so we were able to come and step into a situation that was potentially incredibly dangerous for them. And so the thing that I want to encourage you, husbands, is that when you just say to your wife, we need to go home now, you should add to that, I don't know why, but I have a feeling in my spirit that we need to go home. Totally changes the context for us, yes? Thank you, ladies. Because I was like, if you felt like that, why the heck didn't you say that? Let's go, why are we here? <laughs> Vital piece of information. Yeah. <laughs> so, but... Spiritual gifts, we need them. We need, the, we need to be a discerning people. Uh, discerning is from the Greek word, I don't even want to say it, diacrisis, diacrisis. It's distinguishing, perceiving, or discerning. Spirits, um, spirits is a translation of the Greek word pneumation. It is plural, and it refers to spirits or spiritual situations. So not just the one thing, two things. Uh, Rick Renner, awesome man of God, he says that when these words are joined together to form the phrase discerning of spirits, it means to perceive things or perceive things because often this is where we perceive it in here. Uh, we perceive things that are spiritual, a supernatural ability to read or perceive the true nature of a situation. How many people are going, ah, in their mind, something that's happened in their life and discern what spiritual forces are really at work in a person's life or a certain situation. Okay. We've done two. 
We'll do a third. We'll do a third. We've got enough time. So discovering the gift of prophecy, because this is actually the one that we all want to get to, hey? So 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10. Again, and to another power, the power to work miracles, to another the gift of prophecy, and to another the gift to discern what the Spirit is speaking, to another the gift of speaking different kinds of tongues, and to another the gift of interpretation of tongues. Whew. So this is part of the say category. So say, say. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, say, say. That doesn't make sense. Say, say. We're going to say something. It is an inspiration gift, and it comes from the priestly floor. So, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, it is good that you are enthusiastic. He's talking to us, because we're all enthusiastic, and we're passionate about spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. In another translation, it says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. To... For clarity, let's just define what the difference is between what a prophetic gift is and who is a prophet. Is there any difference? We often think prophecy is telling the future. No. Prophecy is there to edify, comfort. <laughs> Sorry, my autocorrect has gone explore. <laughs> Exalt. It's exalt or exhort, exhort other believers. It is a spoken word of inspiration. You can, however, use multiple gifts, supernatural wisdom, supernatural knowledge, while operating in the gift of the prophetic. So, uh, the office of a prophet is very different from operating in the gift of prophecy. It's a gift from God again, but God chooses the office. It's not our choice. We can't desire, well, we could desire after all things, I suppose. But it's to train, equip, direct, correct, warn, and govern. It's a gift to the body of Christ. It's part of the fivefold ministry to equip the saints. It's a calling for life. We need supernatural love to operate this gift. Uh, I don't know if you, when you read through the Old Testament, I kind of feel like prophets are like grumpy sad people. Do you kind of get that feeling? And I guess sometimes when you are always seeing hard things, it's, it would be hard to just not be hard against that and just be like angry, <laughs> which is why it says we need a gift of supernatural love. Just A prophet's communication should never be judgmental or critical. Its responsibility isn't to prophesy over individuals. A prophet teaches the church how to hear the voice of God more clearly. They give direction to the church leadership by showing the timing of God for where they are going and how to stay on track. A prophet gives direction, redirection, and correction. And a prophet sees into the spiritual realms where others cannot. So that's a prophet. Prophecy, so gift of prophecy, is not rebuking. It's not criticizing or judgmental. It's not guidance. It should only ever confirm what the Holy Spirit is talking to you about. Okay, this is really important. When someone has a word for you, don't just ever assume that it's, it's going to be all good. And, you know, especially if someone we don't know. And I remember when we were growing up in youth, my dad, he was our youth pastor. And no matter where we went, he always said to us, if you don't know who the man is, then pray before you get prayed for. Lord, whatever is not of you, I pray that it falls to the ground. Nothing's going to take seed in my heart that's not from you for me. And so he would always, <laughs> my dad, he's not as big as, tall as Dan, but he's a bit wider and he's still, he's still a pretty big Marty man. And every time that our young people would go up on altar calls, he'd be with, right behind them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like the preacher would be like looking in like, who the heck are you? <laughs> he's like, mm, yes, that's right. Mm. <laughs> protecting. He was protecting. Prophecy never contradicts the word of God. God is not confused. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He doesn't change his mind. And prophecy should never leave us discouraged, depressed, or humiliated. Okay? Is that all right? Because we're moving into times where a lot of this is going to be flowing, and we just need to be safe about it. So, 
Why do we have prophecy? To edify, for building each other up. To, ex, to edify in Greek is a picture of a home being built using a set of blueprints designed to create the exact structure that the architect envisioned from the beginning. When we edify or prophesy over each other, we help confirm what he's building. How cool is that? It's kind of just like a little pat on the back, like, girl, you got this, you're doing awesome, you know, and you're like, yes, I'm doing awesome. God sees me, he's seeing all my hard work. To exhort, lifting each other. Exhort comes from the Greek word parakaleo, meaning someone who has come closely alongside another person for the sake of speaking to him, consoling him, comforting him, or assisting him. And the overarching meaning is counseling, supernatural counseling. Operating in this gift might look more like uh, you might be, wherever you are, driving in the car, sitting at your office at work, I don't know, doing a workout, you could be on the toilet, but God drops someone into your mind and you're like, oh, hey, I'm just thinking about Tara right now. Oh, well, Lord, I just pray for her and whatever she's, you know, pray for a good day or whatever. And you just might flicker a message and say, hey, just been thinking about you, praying that you're doing all good, you know, blah, 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 blah. No biggie, carry on with your day. But we have no idea the significance of what that has done for her. It could be a phone call, it could be a card, it could be a visit. But that's part of operating in this gift. Um, and the other thing about Holy Spirit, you know, when we talk to comfort each other, healing each other, um, you know, the great healer is Holy Spirit. And God wants Holy Spirit to be our supreme counsellor our supreme comforter. <laughs> Why? How do we know this? Because Jesus came to earth. He knows how tough it is here. He became a man. He knew how tough it was. And so Holy Spirit is really good because sometimes we can come up for ministry or for prayer and we're like, God, I don't know what it is or I think it's this. And then all of a sudden the person can give you a word and it's like nothing what you thought. And then all of a sudden it breaks open something inside you. And just, you know, overwhelming joy or sometimes just tears will come because he's dealing with something that you didn't even know you needed being dealt with. That is the power of Holy Spirit coming in. That is the power of this. He is our supreme comforter. We're going to finish in a minute. Can I have the band? So 1 Corinthians 14, verse 31 in the New King James says, For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. See, the heart of God is that he wants us to help each other, to strengthen each other, to instruct so that they can walk with him. It's what he wants. He just wants us to walk with him. He wants us to, to do life with him. He wants us to love him. He wants us to worship him. So characteristics of prophecy, it's for the believer, by the believer. Every believer is encouraged to prophesy. It is supernaturally revealed. It's for the three E's, edification, exhortation, oh, and a C, comfort. It reveals God's investment in every aspect of our lives, even the most minor details. So we've touched on four, four gifts. I knew I was dreaming, trying to get through all nine. But we're going to stand. <laughs> so part of these spiritual gifts is that we need to activate them. So how do we activate? That's fine, Pania, that's all cool. How do I activate mine? By faith. By faith. If, if you're sitting there and maybe, maybe one of those gifts you're like no those aren't my gifts but we can all want the gift of prophecy I want you to I want you to come forward I want our house I want Peak Vision Church to be a house that doesn't just operate in the gifts of the spirit but that we flourish in it that this is a place where we are confident in who we are 
we're confident in our community. We're confident in who God is and the task that He has for us to do. And to, to, you know, God has given us this ground and we've occupied it and it's all good, but we've got more ground to go. And these, this is the key. These spiritual gifts and activating them are the key. And so if you want, we're gonna pray, but if you want your spiritual gifts activated in your life, I wanna encourage you, come to the front and we're gonna say a prayer together. I'm just gonna give you a moment to come to the front. <laughs> it's just a simple acknowledgement. Yeah, God, I want my spiritual gifts to be activated. Or I kinda know what they are, but I want more. Like I wanna move stronger, stronger in them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to say this prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm humbled by all I've heard. And rather than focus on my inability to do what you've asked me to do, I am honoured that you would call me to this high and holy stewardship. It is not an accident because he who has called me is faithful. You also will do it. I rest in that truth. What you start, you finish. I humbly accept this calling to represent you with power and love. Give me the faith and courage. I need to step out of the boat and into the water for it is there you will meet me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now, if you don't know Jesus, you've got loads of gifts that are waiting to be unraveled. And one of those gifts was His beautiful Son who came to earth, lived a perfect life. And then He took all our shame, all our guilt, all our sin, all our short fallings, shortcomings, and He nailed them to a cross where He died a bloody, brutal, painful death. Not to finish there, but so that we would have life with Him, so that we could live a life full of gifts, full of goodness, and if you would like to receive Him today, we've got our prayer team up here who would love to lead you in a prayer and welcome you to the kingdom. It's a great place to be. It's the best decision I ever made. But um, yeah, actually, why don't we pray? We'll just pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your son. I believe that he died and rose again. I thank you for your gifts for me. In Jesus' name, amen.